A new week of news coverage on CNN 10 begins with a look at the politics and the plight of the people of Venezuela. I'm Carl Azus. Thank you for giving us 10 minutes of your Monday. Part of Venezuela's crisis has to do with its government. President Nicolas Maduro began a second term as president earlier this year, but the political groups that oppose him say the election he won wasn't free and fair. President Maduro has said his presidency is truly democratic. But after his second term began, a Venezuelan lawmaker named Juan Guaido, who called his nation's government a dictatorship, declared himself to be the new temporary leader of Venezuela. And other nations began taking sides. The U.S., Europe, and most of the countries around Venezuela have spoken out against President Maduro and in support of Guaido, while Bolivia, Cuba, and Russia have said they're behind President Maduro. One thing everyone will be watching for is what happens when self-declared leader Guaido returns to Venezuela this week. He's been traveling through South America working to increase support for a peaceful change in Venezuela's leadership. He's also met with U.S. Vice President Mike Pence while he was in Colombia. But Guaido's trip abroad had been banned by Venezuela's Supreme Court. So the question of whether he'll be arrested when he returns and how people inside and outside Venezuela will react is hanging with heavy tension in the air. After important meetings here in Bogota with Vice President Mike Pence, the opposition leader, the self-declared interim president of Venezuela, uh, Juan Guaido, uh, had a stark choice to make. Was he going to stay here and drop international support, effectively a leader in exile, or go back to the country he says he's president of? I asked him what his choice was going to be when I caught up with him earlier on. Thank you for your time, sir. Do you intend to go back to Venezuela this week? Sí. Yes, we are going to return to Venezuela this week. We've had a very interesting international agenda this week. The humanitarian community in Cucuta, the meeting of the Lima group here in Bogota with important results. They were able to see that the crisis is evident, but that the regime denies it. Now, in that interview, he said that, yes, he did fear arrest when he landed, and he did fear for his own safety, that of his own life, but compared his potential uh, risk to the plight of thousands of Venezuelans every single day, many, he said, dying from lack of basic medicines. He also said that if anything happened to him, the price would potentially be too high for the Maduro government to pay. Still, in the days ahead, we'll learn how he's going to do this, and certainly whether the Maduro government let him in freely and safely, to quote the words and the demand of the U.S. special representative to the Venezuelan crisis, Elliot Abrahams. Now a look at how this has impacted Venezuela's people. Their nation's economy is wrecked. Critics blame the socialist policies of Venezuela's last two presidents, plus the falling price of oil, which is crucial to the country's revenues. Inflation is soaring. Last year, prices on things like food doubled every 19 days. Venezuelan troops loyal to President Maduro recently blocked truckloads of supplies from entering the country. Guaido says they're needed, that Venezuela's food and medicine shortages are getting worse. President Maduro says there's no crisis in Venezuela and that the supplies are part of a U.S. attempt to overthrow his government. Still, many Venezuelans are crossing borders to get what they can. A lifeline crossing, barricaded, formally closed. But here, the Colombia-Venezuela border is still bustling. And in the distance, people seem to be getting across. How? Clashes exactly a week ago closed that border. It's now almost fortified, but people desperate to get food back to their loved ones inside Venezuela, well, they found another way. Down, we follow the tide as Colombian police stand calmly by. These are steps of necessity, of desperation by people in need of everything. Endless in number, down to the riverbank. But these don't seem to be steps of just salvation, helped as they are at first. Across the water, past the tree line, we are told, are sometimes Venezuelan soldiers, but mostly gangs, who charge for each crossing. 50 cents per person and $2 equivalent if you're carrying goods. Cars and trucks wait for me over there, he says. It's mostly just guys, not soldiers. It's pesos, they ask for. Another adds, it's not soldiers. I don't know who gets the money. The dead go back to be buried in their homeland. 
and the living feel the slow collapse of their homeland bury them. Traffic both ways, but with one shared Venezuelan burden. If you leave, it's more or less empty handed. Yet those who go back, well, they do so with pretty much everything they can carry. Up on the bridge, where thousands once crossed daily, are the pellets fired last week to keep opposition protesters back, who below still carry on with their skirmishes and defences. A people whose world is measured in varying degrees of nothing and whose suffering here finds only further exploitation. Nick Payton Walsh, CNN, Cucuta, Colombia. <laughs> 10 second trivia. In which of these countries would you find the Nakdong River? South Korea, North Korea, Vietnam, or Thailand? The Nakdong is the second longest river in South Korea. It's found in the southeastern part of the country. For three months now, firefighters in South Korea have been battling blazes in an unusual place a giant horseshoe-shaped trash pile. 11 years ago, a recycling business owner was given a permit to keep 2,000 tons of waste there. But in 2016, residents complained that trash was overtaking the area and the permit was canceled. After the site was sold to someone else in 2017, the previous owner was accused of dumping more than 80 times the amount of garbage allowed at the site. And the problem, like the trash heap itself, has flared up. 170,000 tons of illegal waste dumped on prime farming land. A health risk and an eyesore, South Korea is struggling to deal with its own rubbish. Park Hyun Soon has farmed here for 10 years. Her greenhouses are just meters from the expanding dump. First of all, there's the dust, she tells me. The greenhouse is a shell of plastic sheeting. The dust covers it up, blocks the light, and my eggplants are starting to grow gnarled. Since December, the dump is now starting to self-combust. As years-old waste decomposes, it produces flammable and toxic gases. Workers and firefighters douse the fire with water, only to see it reignite elsewhere. The smell of burning household waste, of burning plastic, construction materials, is really quite unpleasant. And this is the winter time. It's sub-zero temperatures at the moment. Just imagine what this is like in the summer. One of those who lives very close by says she hasn't opened her windows in the past two years. The company that owns this dump changed hands just over a year ago. The CEO tells CNN the previous owner dumped almost 170,000 tonnes of mostly illegal mixed waste at market rates that could raise more than $20 million. We were unable to contact him. Local officials say he's under investigation. They first took legal action five years ago to limit him to his original permit of a small storage site for recyclables. The government has now had to allocate a budget of $5 million for this, one official tells me. We plan to remove 21,000 tonnes of waste within the year. Illegal dumping is happening across the country and beyond. This is Mindanao in the Philippines. 6,500 tonnes of waste that a South Korean company had claimed was recyclable plastic synthetic flakes. In reality, it's filled with batteries, straws, electronic products, used diapers. After pressure from local environment groups, the South Korean government again had to step in and pay for its repatriation. China's decision to accept less of the world's waste and unscrupulous companies dumping illegally to make money means South Korea has a new waste reality to deal with. Paula Hancock, CNN, Wisong County, South Korea. <laughs> A dive roller coaster is one that drops at 90 degrees, meaning you're diving straight down as opposed to a less steep downhill angle. And this is going to be the tallest, fastest, and longest dive coaster in the world when it's finished. It's called the Yukon Striker. It's set to open this spring at Canada's Wonderland theme park. Its main plunge is 245 feet straight down, and its top speed is 80 miles per hour. So what will be the fallout? Some will surely fall for it, and if you're thrilling to strike her out for a wild ride, Yukon too. But some will see it and want to roll her on by. If the thought of 90 degrees makes them sweat with their mind or stomach getting twisted up or off track or thrown for a loop, they won't want to ride out this dive of a coaster. I'm Carl Azus for CNN.